Okay, here we go. This is going to be my first official attempt at making an extemporaneous audio recording to be posted on Iterations of Zero. And as such, it's probably going to be a little bit disjointed. I'm just going off the cuff. I'm not planning very much about what to say. I'm just going to try to see how this works. The reason I'm doing this is because I had this idea of writing more articles, more blog posts for Iterations of Zero about thoughts that come to my mind and things that I want to deal with, but it's hard to work the time in to do that without disrupting my schedule for writing fiction, and I don't want to take time away or writing energy away from my writing of fiction and the editing of fiction. So, I'm hoping that this will work as an alternative. Certainly it's going to be a lot easier than trying to do videos, and this can of course be turned into videos and put on YouTube just by putting up simple symbol, probably my iterations of zero symbol, on as the uh, video portion of the, uh, of the upload, and then just making the audio into the video portion, as I've done with the chapters and stories I recorded already. I obviously, one good thing about this is I can edit out pauses and breaths and mumblings and things that are unclear. That's going to be nice. Also, I can kind of just take my time to get to my point and you know, get whatever comes out, out, as it comes out. Now, this is a bit of a concession on my part, because I don't like to give ground too much to the uh, diminishment of written word. I think that written language is the lifeblood of civilization. I say that all the time, at least in my head I do. And I think it's true. I mean, I think that every other major invention that we have every other advance with the possible exception of fire and stone tools and sticks really required written language to take place and in fact even the art of making stone tools could easily have become lost if there were no written language to say for instance if that was the pinnacle of our technology and we had no written language and there was some break in the chain some artisan died without teaching anyone how to make a stone axe, say. And all other people could do was kind of look at it and see. They could maybe relearn, refigure out how to do it, but they'd have to do that. They wouldn't be able to go to written material and just read the instructions. Written language is a very efficient way of storing and spreading information. If you don't think that's true, just compare the size of this audio file or any video file, even more, to a transcript of any speech or written language. The entire file for unanimity, the draft, the first draft, which is 530,000 words long, basically 1.46 megabytes for that much information. Now, if we had an audio file, say, like an audible version of that book in draft form, obviously, but even, even if once it's, once it's cut down and made into a, a more workable book, we'd have a very, very large file indeed. And, of course, video don't even get started. So video, not really very efficient, though certainly engaging. Audio, somewhere in the middle. But I also know that audio is very popular. Um, it's a very good medium. You can listen to things on your commute. You can listen to things while you're waiting in line at the grocery store. You know, you can't do that with a video. You shouldn't do that while you're driving, certainly. You shouldn't be watching videos. But you can listen to an audio of a book. You can listen to the radio. You can listen to uh, music, obviously. Uh, similarly, you can't read, which, for all that I do have uh, my greatest love for reading and writing, you have to have your eyes free to be able to read, whereas you can listen to a book, an audio, or a podcast, or the jabbering and chattering like I'm doing now, anywhere you want, basically. With headphones, you really can do it anywhere you want, although I don't recommend doing it in the middle of a business meeting, because that would probably look bad. So it has it has a lot of advantages, and I can understand why it's popular. I listen to podcasts and especially audiobooks all the time. I've listened to some great audiobooks. There's plenty of books that I've actually read and then listened to audio. 
I did that with most of the Harry Potter books. That was back when I had to buy first tapes and then ultimately CDs to listen to them. I listen to them over and over because I've always, for some reason, tended to have long commutes. Maybe everybody does. Nowadays, I tend to listen to nonfiction almost exclusively. I've, uh, you know, I'm a member of Audible, so I get one free credit a month that pretty much gets me a book every month. And I recommend that, by the way. It's really nice. I'm not being paid to recommend them. Maybe someday I will be. But I do recommend it. It's a, it's a great resource. And uh, listening to, I, I, there's, like I said, there's plenty of books that I've both read and then listened to, first again with fiction, but then now, even with nonfiction, I read David Deutsch's The Beginning of Infinity, uh, Max Tegmark's uh, Our Mathematical Universe, and then decided, you know what, I want to I want to get the audio to go with those. First off, you get a discount on the audio if you have the Kindle edition of the book in most cases, uh, so that's nice. And uh, and anyway, it's 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 a great way to get more out of the book at the same time. I know I'm not the only one to do this. I also, like I said, tend to listen to two podcasts. These are the, the two main podcasts I listen to are the Sam Harris formerly Waking Up podcast, now Making Sense podcast, and I listen to Sean Carroll's uh, Mindscape. I think he calls it. Both really good podcasts. Two pretty different personalities, but both very smart people who talk to very interesting people. And again, uh, through Sam Harris's podcast that I've uh, come to be curious about a lot of different people's books and ideas and thoughts. And so, for instance, I knew of Max Tegmark just because of my interest in physics. But after hearing him on the uh, Waking Up podcast, I bought his books and I'm very happy about that. David Deutsch, similarly. And uh, his may be even better, although, eh, just different. Never mind, not better. I'm not going to try to take any time uh, on this particular occasion to discuss some of the things that I had wanted to write blog post about for Iterations of Zero. I may save that for the future. I certainly can't save it for the past, can I? But I, I basically, right now, I'm just sort of just feeling it out, trying it out, seeing what happens. Obviously, after I do this, I'm going to have to edit the audio, but because it's not a performance per se, like when I was reading my stories, uh, I don't really need to edit it for content much. I don't need to retake and retake if I misspeak a line from a book. I can't even get my own written words out correctly. I don't need to worry about that with this. I could just go and... Yeah, I can take out the pauses when they get too long, and if I say things that are basically not particularly useful or interesting, I guess I can edit them out, and I make no promises about not editing. This is, uh, this is something I'm doing for me, and I don't know whether anybody will even listen to it. Probably if I go forward and decide to start making these files about my reactions to and thoughts about current events or issues, concerns, whether they have to do with, uh, you know, scientific stuff that I have interest in and understanding of that I can try to maybe help explain for some people. Or if I go, for instance, uh, and address, well, the vaccine issue is a big one for me. The, the fact that so many people uh, fall prey to the availability heuristic and don't realize because they are fortunate enough to live in a world where vaccines have successfully fought back many terrible illnesses, those illnesses no longer have the gut impact that they had for people who came before and for people who have studied medicine and, and understand what these diseases have done to people how they spread, and what the nature of vaccines are. So they get their non-information and disinformation and misinformation from blogs that could have been made by some teenager in his underwear in his parents' basement instead of actually you know, going and, well, hey, get a high school-level textbook of biology and then maybe get a, an undergraduate-level biology, read a little pathophysiology, read a little immunology and infectious disease, uh, you know, get the basics and understand how viruses work, how diseases work, and how vaccines work. 
then at least come at it with with an educated uh, an educated mind. I mean, the, I respect people being paranoid and being untrusting, but if you're not going to trust the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control and all the scientists from various and sundry organizations, most of whom are not directly funded by quote unquote big pharma, why are you going to trust some podunk website that somebody threw together and who has no data, no deep knowledge or understanding of the issues or the actual facts of reality with which you're dealing. Now, there are other issues involved in this. There are ethical issues and legal issues that I have some sympathy for. The idea of mandatory vaccination, although I think it's probably a necessity I have a lot more sympathy with people who say, look, I'm fine with vaccines, but I'm really uncomfortable with mandating people get vaccines. I understand that. I'm libertarian by tendency, if not by any kind of official designation of my own. I don't label myself in particular, except to say that I am me, this guy who you're listening to. I don't commit to any particular brand or breed of thought, except to say that I try to be rational. and. Part of that is failing a lot of the time. So I get that, and I get the fact that, you know what, the people who are in your local government, in your state government, and in your federal government, these people you can see are not the brightest bulbs. They are not our finest minds. They are not our finest characters. They are not, I mean, the President of the United States is a person currently of very low character. I mean, if my daughter was dating somebody with that kind of personality, I would be horrified. Or if my son was, for that matter, too. If a friend was dating somebody with that kind of character, I'd be like, what in the world are you doing? Get away from that person. That person is a disaster. But he's not actually that much of an outlier amongst uh, the people you see. I mean, the idiot in Congress... This, there's been more than one person who's done this, I think, but I know that there was one gentleman, I'll use the term loosely, who came in with a snowball to the House of Representatives or to the Senate, I don't remember which one it was, but basically trying to use the fact that it was snowing outside to provide some kind of what he thought was a counterpoint to the notion of climate change, global warming. That, that's, that the fact that he actually thought that was a point that he actually thought that meant anything, shows what an ignoramus he is. And, and makes me, frankly, just despair sometimes. The level... This, this is one of the, one of the reasons I'm spending less time on Facebook, particularly, than I used to, is the level of not ignorance. You know, we're all infinitely ignorant. There's an infinite number of things we don't know. There's always only a finite number of things that we do know. But the, the blatant Dunning-Kruger effect out there for those of you who don't know, the Dunning-Kruger effect is a phenomenon whereby people who are very, uh, people with low expertise in particular subject matter tend to overrate their knowledge and ability in that area. And people with great expertise in a particular subject tend to learn that there's a lot they don't know. It's like the old Socrates thing, you know, he was the wisest man in the world because he was the only man who knew that he didn't know anything, so to speak. Um, or like in the wonderful poem Second Coming by Yeats, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. When you're ignorant and when you keep yourself ignorant willfully, it's easy to think things are simpler than they really are. When you start to understand that things are complicated and things are difficult, you start to second-guess yourself. And that's good, because you shouldn't be cocky. But on the other hand, if the idiots are going to just roll over the smart people because they have the courage of their stupidity, that's not a good precedent to have. And I don't know what the right answer to this problem is. It's a big issue, and probably has always been. I mean, look, look like I said... Going back to Socrates, probably before then. So, it's tricky. I mean, we've, we've survived so far, thankfully, but our power is making that more and more potentially hazardous. 
I mean, it was, it's sort of ironic. The, the, the advances we made, generally speaking, have all been because of the work of the sharpest people, certainly the, the higher percentages of people. You know, there's very few inventions and innovations made by mediocre people. You know, the average person contributes. Don't get me wrong. They do. They, they put in the work. They build. They manufacture. They are part of the economy, the main part of the economy, probably. But the advancements are the products of exceptional individuals, generally speaking. You know, maybe not one in a million, you know, one in a thousand, maybe. But the advancements in general are made by people who are above average. And obviously most people aren't above average, even though most people probably think that they are. Again, that's related to the Dunning-Kruger effect. So there's a bit of an irony there. All the advances that have been made by the people who really are innovative and creative increase the danger posed by the, the Dunning-Krugerites. Because, think about it, Donald Trump has his finger on the button. He could launch nuclear weapons, assuming that he wasn't flagrantly disobeyed by all of his subordinates if he were to give that order, which he might be. But in any case, he has the official role in our government that he could initiate a nuclear war at his discretion. And although probably, I suspect, if he tried to, people would disobey him, that would set up another bad precedent, because it would be a precedent of taking away the president's civilian authority over the military, which is supposed to be there for a reason. The military is supposed to be subservient to the interests of the civilian population, not the other way around. So it is concerning, and it's, tr it's, it's, it's a problem. I do wish that more people would be interested in having elite people in our government. But, I, I don't know, maybe, it's, maybe you have to, to, to... Well, you certainly have to stop and think about things, at least, to want to to choose elite people. And let's face it, picking elite people from amongst the many candidates is harder work than just picking somebody who the shape of the face, the, the, the appearance, instead of thinking through and using their system two thoughts to try to evaluate the person's pros and cons. That takes work. That takes effort. And unfortunately, even though it is definitely worth the effort, and the consequences are great, they are not immediate consequences. They're consequences that are just put off indefinitely down the road, and when things blow up in your face, you don't even recognize that that was a consequence of that choice you made a few years ago in voting for this person. And the, the, another, I mean, an astonishing thing that always bothers me is you, you see how people, the general public approval rating of Congress and the Senate has been deplorable. It's rarely above 20%. It's been as low as 11%, maybe even a little lower within the past few decades. And I honestly, before then, I wasn't paying enough attention to recall how high the approval rating was. I have this sense that it was higher in the past, but I may be wrong about that. In any case, approval rating in the 10 to 20% range. If, if you were giving a 10 to 20% approval to an employee of yours whom you were paying out of the pocket of your business, you would fire them and replace them. I've written on this blog about that. You would, by picking a random person off the street, be likely to get somebody better than someone who you, you approve of at only the 10 to 20% rate. You could pick a random person and do better on average. But 90 to 95 percent of the time incumbents are re-elected by the same people who disapprove of Congress, probably because they're thinking, like people do, it's all those other people who are bad. My guy, my lady, they're fine. But of course, that's not logical. Most people have to be wrong about that. And if most people have to be wrong about that, it's a fair chance that you are wrong about it if you think it about your candidate we would probably all be better off if each person just chose to vote against an incumbent without even paying attention to who their opposition was at the time. We just shuffled the whole thing. Now, there's something to be said for expertise, of course. 
if we literally replaced everybody all at once in the Senate and House of Representatives, there would be a bit of chaos because, let's face it, every job has to have some learning curve where you figure out how to do it. But, you know, we have support staff and so forth who can help ease those transitions. I mean, we, we put term limits on the president because it is just too easy for a very popular president in a time of crisis like FDR was back in uh, the 30s and 40s to keep being reelected and to eventually become a de facto dictator, if not an actual dictator. So we put term limits into them, and it would be very useful, maybe more useful and more important to have term limits on those who write our laws. Anyway, I'm really meandering around here, but it's it's, it's stuff that I it's stuff that I have uh, have obviously it matters to me. I don't know if you guys can hear the stuff in the background. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in a pretty quiet room here, and I think I'm going to be able to edit out any background noise. There's no fans. The air conditioning is quiet, but the garbage people are currently emptying the dumpster in the parking lot, and it sounds loud to me, but I don't know if you guys will be able to hear it or not. Anyway, um, this has been kind of fun, actually. Even if nothing else, it's it's almost like a little bit of therapy. I don't really get to talk to people at all or have any kind of intelligent conversations. Obviously, when I was, when I was married, I did. I was married to an extremely intelligent woman. Uh, so we could talk about almost anything. She gave as good as she got, so to speak. So that was a blast. And of course, when I was in college and med school and working as a doctor, you know, you had at least a, a fair amount of uh, back and forth with people who were also thinking about things. But right now I'm involved in sales. And again, I'm just working basically right now to stay alive so that I can do my writing and this kind of thing. But it's not intellectually stimulating work. And I'm not surrounded. It's not that I'm surrounded by people who are unintelligent. There's actually some quite intelligent, surprisingly, strikingly smart people, people with the potential to really, really shine. But because of various social and psychological circumstances, they don't. But none of them have any sort of background or, or, or interest in the sorts of things I like to talk about like this. So this is kind of nice, even as just a therapy session, whether or not anybody listens to it. So we'll see. I'd love, obviously, for people to listen to it and give me feedback in the comments section, whether on the, the blog Iterations of Zero itself or when I post it as a, as a quote-unquote video on YouTube on my channel. But, you know, it's... it's uh, just, sorry, as a, as a slight tangent, uh, something I just said before, I've been moaning a little bit about how much Dunning-Kruger effect there is I want to make it clear that, like like I just said about the people in the place I am working, there are a lot of people out there who are smarter than they think they are. These people are not the problem. Most people, I think, are smarter and more capable than they believe they are. Certainly, that's been my experience. I've taught people at various levels various different things and have recognized that there are people who just have a fear or maybe have been convinced by others that they aren't as bright as they think they are. They think because a concept is difficult, that means they're dumb. And that's definitely not true. There's, reality is complicated. Reality is not easy. So don't let that make you think you're stupid just because you don't understand everything instantly. That probably means you're smart to recognize it. The people who are the Dunning-Krugerites are the people who don't think but think that they're smart. Case in point, our current commander-in-chief. These are the people who are the most dangerous. And like assholes everywhere, they make a lot more noise and do a lot more harm relative to their representation in the population. And it's easy when you look at the world to think that there are so many jerks and assholes and idiots out there. But these are the people who make the most noise. It's a bit like... Even the news only reports about bad things that happen. When you hear about school shootings or other public shootings, you think, my God, these things are happening everywhere all the time. This is a terrible crisis. This is horrible. The whole world is just, just riddled with this. When actually, 
they don't even make a rounding error in the total of gun deaths in this country, most of which are by people shooting people they know. A third of them, is it a third or two-thirds, two-thirds of gun deaths in the United States are consistently suicides, which is, calls to attention the fact that this is a bigger problem. I, I think that we should consider many of the drug overdose deaths that we're seeing to be rather almost a form of suicide in many people. Certainly, I know in some people they are. There's clearly a reckless disregard for one's own life when one abuses drugs. You can't not know that it's dangerous. You can lie to yourself, of course, and there are people who do, and those people may just be accidental deaths. But there are also people, and I've known them, and I've seen them die, not literally, but who don't like themselves and don't like their lives and basically just want to escape from it if it's the escape just to be numb while high for a little bit or the escape of actually dying from a drug overdose. It's not a conscious decision, but I think it's real. And maybe I'll talk about that more in the future. Anyway, I've already passed, I've just passed the half hour mark. And uh, I think it's been pretty successful so far. When I edit it, it'll probably be shorter than half an hour, but who knows, maybe not. I think that that's probably a long enough time to keep this. I don't want to keep going, especially since I don't have a specific topic in mind. But thank you for listening, if you have listened. If you haven't listened, uh, I'm not talking to you, am I? Woo! If, if a tree falls in the woods and no one hears it, can I be made into a podcast? I doubt it. Talk to you later.